Hey, what's the deal, YouTube? It's your girl, Miss Honey. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. It is your girl, Miss Honey, here for a season two power review. Um, I don't know, you guys. I'm going to try to hold on and do this whole thing with this power book, too. Um... I don't know. I think I just need to get back into the swing of things. Um, have you guys seen the episode yet? What do you guys think? Please, please, please put it down below. Um, are you into this season? Um, I want to see this whole power verse thing through because I did enjoy raising Canaan. Um, I don't know. I think I just need to get back into the swing of things with Tariq and this whole... Um, I'm a drug dealer situation. Also, I think I just miss all of the original ghost people. Like even Kanan, I miss, uh, Tommy and James St. Patrick and Tasha and Angela. And all we have, the only remnants that we have of that crew is Stax. And I'm just, <laughs> I feel like I've been, we've been, you know, bamboozled and stuck with Tariq which by the way um the character the guy who plays the character Tariq is getting older he's kind of growing into his features and I'm enjoying that I'm enjoying that um I'm starting to see him as older as a college kid um there is a scene where he is at Braden's house with his family, uh, the Caucasians. And um, I don't know why I did quote fingers. They are actually white. <laughs> um, and uh, he's got a glass of champagne. And I'm like, is is he old enough to drink? Or maybe that's just what Caucasians do with their kids. I don't know. Anyway, so <clears throat> I'm going to try something different this year. Um, with this review and let's see what happens. Okay, so this is season two episode one free will is never free and that title is Coming out of the canonical studies class because Jabari isn't there obviously and So we have professor puss who's teaching the class and these were some questions that um uh, Professor Jabari left behind for her, you know, that was going to be his like next class questions for the next class. So here we are. And it was all of this conversation about free will. And of course, Tariq is the center point of the class. He makes some very, very good points about, um, the whole concept of free will, um, everything being your choice, um, all your choices being decided by your own will. Like, it's this whole thing. Um, we still have all of our old class members. Um, the, uh, the, um, brown skin black girl who, um, you know, she kind of, she's smart, but she kind of ghetto all at the same time. You know, uh, Asian guy responded to her uh comment and he called her sis she was like yada 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 blah 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 call me again call me sis again do it super funny <laughs> so it's just little moments like that but that's where the title came from um so Tariq uh tries to resume his normal college life now you know he the last thing we saw with him technically was him shooting Jabari. Um, one shot came from Kane and that kill shot came from Tariq. Tariq is struggling. Tariq is struggling. Uh, for the first time we see him struggling with not only having killed his dad, but, um, having killed Jabari and, uh, I forgot the other. Oh yeah. You know, he, he killed several other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they never really revisit the kill that he did as a teenager. I don't know if it's coming, but anyway, he's having all of these, um, kind of flashback type situations. 
Um, he's still having to handle school and dealing with all of this. And plus, he's got to prep himself. He and Kane are the only ones that know that he's the one that killed Jabari. So he's he's still trying to hold on to the fact that um, he's got to be super surprised. Meanwhile, um, his his uh, grandmama, who's taking care of Yaz, is on that yak. And... Um, her drinking is getting progressively worse, so he is trying to get in touch with Tasha. He gave her a burner phone, and he has a burner phone, and every time he goes to check it, he has to put the battery in it and the SIM card in it um, just to see if she's called him, if she's reached out to him, and she has not done so yet, which is crazy to me. Although he has his reasons why he's trying to reach out to his mom because he wants her to get Yaz away from the granny, but at the same time... Why isn't Tasha calling her son? I mean, the last thing we saw was her like, no, Tariq, no, don't do this, Tariq, please. I don't want to stay with you. I don't want to leave y'all. Y'all come with me. Right? So why isn't she trying to get, I don't know. Maybe Witsack is just superbly done and she can't reach out. So he's got that going on too. On top of the fact that he's got Kanan on his butt because Jabari's murder is now in the news. And um, he feels like Tariq should have did more to get rid of the body. Even though they shot um, Jabari with uh, Ramirez's gun. It's not that cut and dry. Like, they're actually investigating this murder. And uh, it's just... It's just things unraveling really, really quick. But Tariq wouldn't be Tariq if he didn't have all of these external pressures weighing in on him. He actually does a lot better when he's under these types of pressure. So um, he's got several um, kegs that are just going to blow at any second. Um, on top of the fact that Braden... Um, is one of the few people that can talk Tariq into anything. I, I just, I'm just suspicious of Brayden. I just don't think he's trustworthy. Even if he is not officially the ops right now, I think given a little bit of pressure, um, I think he'll turn on Tariq. Um, it's a mistake for Tariq to trust him as much as he does. But Tariq is like a lot like his dad. He probably got, um... A setup already for Brayden when Brayden, you know, goes south on him. He probably uh, got something in place where he going to go <laughs> deep, deep south on Brayden, right? So Brayden invites him to his family home. They're going to go uh, hunting as a family. Uh, his dad has bought he and his brother matching BMWs or whatever kind of car it is. And, um, of course, he's invited Tariq because Tariq is supposed to be his deflection, his buffer. And um, there's a congressman there, uh, a, a dim, a Democratic congressman there. Um, and he's old school. He's been in that district forever and ever and ever. He's also a college buddy of Brayden's dad. Um, and he, he sees Tariq and Tariq, you know, he's giving Tariq all of these, you know, microaggressive comments about being low income and special needs and all this stuff, um, needs based education, needs based scholarship. And Tariq is like, actually I paid for my school through my trust fund. He was like, Oh, trust fund. Who's your dad? And it's so obvious. Like the acting is like, you know, it's like, ha ha ha. I'm a supremacist. I'm going to ask some obvious questions that denote my supremacy. <laughs> I mean, it's not slick. It's not even passive aggressive. It's so overt, right? I don't know. It just comes across real cheesy. Uh, but I love Tariq's response. I did love that moment, even though the actor who's playing the congressman, I mean, he was just being so, like, literal, it was just no finesse at all. I was just like, this guy. Anyway, uh, 
tells him who his dad is. Oh, yeah, I met your dad. It's too bad all the all the uh, shady stuff that was said about him. I hope none of those things are true. That's the last thing you need um, is to have, you know, these types of things hanging over your head, especially regarding drugs. He was like, yeah, oh, no, I completely agree. I mean, the opioid crisis in the Appalachian Mountain is horrible. But again, that is big pharma. So he was like, oh no, it's a difference. This is the Congress are doing legal and illegal drugs. And he was like, yeah, big pharma's behind it and they pay big money so that their drugs, which are three, four times as lethal and are killing, um, three times as many people, um, giving it the legal terminology. It's like, well, how many big farmers do you have on your books? He asked the congressman. It was a super sweet moment. Shut the guy up. Like when I say super sweet, I mean like sweet, like burn, right? So, um, that was a good moment. Um, so later on, we get to see what Tariq goes hunting with, with, um, them against his, with, you know, he really doesn't want to go, but because it's keep, it keeps bringing up this whole killing thing, killing thing, you know, and he's got this free will and killing and free will and killing. And this conversation is playing in his head. He does wing a deer and the deer runs off and, um, he and Brayden go after the deer and the congressman, um, shoots at Tariq. Now he hit the tree just behind Tariq, like right at his ear. And it sent Tariq running, comes upon the deer. And the Congress was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I did. I had no idea. Um, I apologize. <clears throat> Why don't you take the kill shot? Oh, accept my apology. It's a position of honor. I was just like killing an innocent animal. Um, and you don't need to. You don't need it for food or any of that. Like, it's disgusting. And my dad was a hunter. Um, but it's disgusting, especially coming from these cockazoids who, um, they don't need it. They don't need it. It's just sport. You know what I mean? It's disgusting. Anyway, um... Braden shot the shot the deer and Tariq is having like the every every time he puts a gun in his hand and he has to take this even this motion of shooting and killing something he's having these flashbacks he's got like a little killer's PTSD um also I mean, he's got the pressure with Monet on him. She wants to know if he knows about this professor and he better not be lying. Of course he's lying. But this is Tariq, you know, this is Tariq. He's got to think on his feet, you know what I'm saying? He's He's got Kane breathing down his neck. <clears throat> and Kane is a for sure killer. And he's got Monet breathing down his neck. Monet is a for sure killer. You know what I mean? So he got to stick and move, stick and move, stick and move. Um, so let's talk about Monet and um, her son and <clears throat> her daughter and Kane. Listen, that whole situation, I don't know. Basically, Monet is catching heat. She shot her distro in last season. Um, so she's got to get that rectified. Um, she alienated and got rid of Kane. He ended up killing Ramirez, who was not only her lover, but also her police protection. Um, her son, who I think is the youngest son, he got shot in the shoulder. And he's turning out to be quite the whiny little character. I don't know. I find him to be a bit whiny. Um, he got shot at the shoulder. Evidently, it's the same arm that he does all of his drawing and painting with. And so he's in a sling, like the cheapest little sling you've ever seen. I was just like, that cheap sling says to me that there's nothing much wrong with you, sir. Where's your physical therapy? Like, he's upset with her. Because he's shot and he can't, he doesn't want to be in the life. He or 
the daughter. The daughter, neither one of them want to be in the life. Um, Monet is running around uh, looking very, very Mary J. Blige. -y. Like, literally, <laughs> you know how Mary J. Blige always look mad about something, always pissed off about something? This is Monet the whole while. She's giving us resting Mary J. Blige face. Um, they go shopping. She doesn't want her daughter to look sexy. She doesn't want her to look beautiful unless... Um, it's to get them out some out of some type of drug trouble. Then her daughter can bust it open and spread it wide, flirt, do whatever she need to do, be as sexy as she needs to be as long as it's for the business. But if the daughter's trying to grow up and be sexy and have her own life and be independent outside of the business, it's a no-go. Monet is shooting it down left and right, including the fact that the daughter like um, Tariq. And, and they can't be alone for six seconds without her peeping around the corner like, uh, go get, go do the dishes, go do this, go that, you know, and this is Monet's big plan. Monet's big plan to get them out of the business in three years. This is what she tell the, 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 the two kids at home is Zeke. Zeke need to go on to the NBA. They going to all work for Zeke and ride his coattails because he owned, he owed a family. Really girl? How does everything ride on Zeke? All Zeke got to do is slip and fall. I mean, it ain't even got to be nothing big. He could slip and fall, literally. He could he could jump wrong and tear his Achilles tendon. I mean, just like, are you serious? <laughs> Outside of the fact that Zeke is dumb as a box of rocks, like... Nah, you can't be, you can't have everybody's future riding on Zeke. Like the son said, Zeke is our new product, basically. It's crazy. It's nonsensical. I can't believe she said it like it was a for real plan. Then she goes down and she basically shakes Zeke down. Basically tells him. He tells her he knows she threatened the professor. Professor Puss, who he loves. And she was like, yeah, you listen, this is what you're going to do. You, I need you to go to NBA. I need you to go to NBA like tomorrow. He was like, well, no, nah. I was like, no, nah, you ain't finna sit out no, no year. Just because you had a little minor head injury, you get your head in the game. We all relying on you. You going to the NBA, okay? The car be here to pick you up tomorrow to drop you off at the NBA. I was like, girl, do you really, really think it's going to be that easy? It's so stupid. Um... We see where Kanan goes to the house after he's had this huge exchange with what he thinks is the new distro. He gets the new distro from um, from an introduction by the old GTG guy that he beat up and threatened and uh, told him that, you know, you work for me now. Um, it's this whole thing where he treats the distro like the distro is the ops. Then these two knuckleheads come in and the distro proves that he's not the ops by killing one of the knuckleheads. The other one runs off later on. Now it's Kane's turn to prove that he's not soft. He's not the ops. He can be trusted uh, in this weird kind of way. Of course, Kane doesn't fail us. He's a truly a psychopath. <laughs> God gives him a knife to kill the guy. The one that ran off from the first exchange. They got him tied up and gives him a knife to kill this guy. You can do it the hard way. You can do it the easy way. You can make him suffer. You can put him out of his misery. Yada, yada, yada. Kane goes over there and cuts the guy loose. <laughs> and, and, and fist the cuffs with the guy. Uh, yeah, cat, cat. The guy tags him a couple of times. Chow, chow. He's got a bloody mouth, right? Bloody teeth. And, uh, you know, once he tastes that blood, it was, something was like, switch. <laughs> switch. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he was like psychopath, right? So he hits the guy, wham, 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 gets around behind him. And he tells the guy, you don't have to test me. You don't have to worry about me because I'm new, I'm, I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. Something something like that. And <laughs> snaps the guy's neck. It was a good moment. <laughs> Woody doesn't let us down. 
He is one of the few characters that for me is believable. For me is, he's really, he's the only one that gives me season one ghost power. Season one power. You remember how brutal it was the first season? Like the first three, four episodes was so brutal. That is, you know, that's what Kane's character, in you know, invokes in me. It's invoke. That's the vibe it gives me. That's what I'm saying. And I like it. I like it. It's sick and sadistic. I know, but I look at the look. At the look. So anyway... Um, he discovers the guy's got tons of drugs there and the guy's like, Hey, what are you doing in here? What are you doing with your, the door to your drugs wide open, all stacked up willy nilly like this? Like, how you gonna get mad at me? You just got the drugs out here in the blue. Like, I'm not supposed to look at this big old stack of drugs. It's stupid. It's supposed to be dramatic. It's supposed to be this tense moment. But Kane was like, look, I can help you. I can get help help you push this weight. He immediately goes to Monet to knock on the windows and bam on the doors after he finds out that the the house is the key the um, she's changed the locks at the house. Mom, come on, really? You changed the lock? She's just standing there. Now, this is the second time she done thought she heard something and pulled the gun and walked through the house. First of all, you are a drug dealer. You pushing weight. You pushing weight. You are supposed to have cameras everywhere. All you got to do is pull it up on your phone. Like, why? I don't... I'm not picking at the scabs, okay? So, anyway... Mom, let me in, please. Let me in. I found us a distro. She just walk on off. I was like, okay, you best get a plan B for your plan A because Zeke is not going to know. If Professor Puss say jump, he going to say how high, and, and he not going to think twice if it's off the side of a building. So you best listen to listen. hear Kane out. Meanwhile, uh, the new distro guy is watching the whole thing go down. So he knows where Monet is. He knows where he already knew that, that, that Kane was a Tahada anyway. So it's just crazy. Um, the last and final thing basically, um, in the episode comes when, um, that dummy, I think that dummy Tariq for as smart as he is, he's stupid. I think he got, got uh the professor's phone the jabari's phone and he done put the battery in it and all of this stuff in the phone ring and when the phone ring he answers it and when he answers it it's a police and they trace it back to stansfield not to him exactly I don't know. Next week they may have a room number, but um, and he takes it, takes the battery out, and throws it down. I was like, "Why do you still have that phone? Why do you still have that phone? That phone should technically be with Ramirez or in the area of Ramirez. Like, what are we doing? I don't know. Did y'all watch the episode? What did you guys think of it? I'd love to know. Um. I'm interested in seeing more from the Kane side of it. I don't really have to see Monet and the kids again. I really, really don't. I don't. I just, I'm not getting anything from that. Um, we can do away with the whole Braden situation. Oh, we have this whole thing with Stax being an associate now of Tariq's old lawyer, <clears throat> Davis McLean. And Davis McLean is... Um, it's just this whole nonsensical scene where, or series of scenes where there is this stupid conversation about um, what McLean is, how McLean is positioning Stax. Um, he's really basically sunning Stax, right? Um, he's got a brother that is incarcerated. I think that's his old rap buddy, um, the guy who plays McLean. Uh, 
I can't think of his name now, but I think he's the other half of their group. Method Man, I think this is Red Man that's in jail, right? That's playing his brother in jail. And um, he's going to use stacks to get his brother out, um, which is oxymoronic within itself, but I digress. Um, and he's got this whole scene where he's getting him suited up, you know, getting him fitted. He's in the haberdashers, getting getting him fitted for a suit. Like, it's just ridiculous. Um, we also do get to see um, Congressman Tate. He's supposed to be laid out drunk. He's been, you know, defunct as governor, running for governor. Now he is um, imploring the head of the DNC to give him a thumbs up to run um, for this district, this congressman's district, the one that shot at Tariq. Um, and so he's supposed to be fired up to do all that. I'll, I'll take Congressman's story. I'll take the Kane story. Um, everything else, like I like it. I'd like us to ratchet it up a notch. I'm just not getting power. I'm not getting that same cutting edge power feel. Um, yeah. Anyway, y'all tell me what y'all think. Y'all put it down below. And until next time, honeybees. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I'll holler.